let's go forward one and let's look at another set of defined stress states. And we can see in this particular description, as is shown in the, in the top case here, where we have a set of stresses here, could be the same thing, could be defined as 20 MPa. In this case, we have sigma 1, 2 is equal to sigma 2, 1 is equal to some value, and perhaps we'll, we'll say that sigma naught is equal to, once again, 20 MPa, right, for our defined set of stresses where this is a sigma, and if I were to be describing this in terms of any tensorial quantity, I might want to make this bold, or I might want to either make that a sigma ij. So we have some set of axes. Of course, we can define the axes however we want. Let's pick a set of axes that uh, that will allow us to, to describe this. Let's, let's pick a set of axes where z is pointing up, x is coming out, and y is going this way. If we do that, then this particular set of, of stresses is got to be applied with sigma 1, 2. It's going to be in the x direction and the positive y phase. Right? And sigma 2, 1 is going to be in the y direction on the positive 2 phase, and there would have to be the corresponding one on the back. Okay, So that would be a particular set of applied stresses. We could also switch up the axes or define the axes in a, a different way. To describe this, let's pick a different set of axes. Let's pick x and y this way. So now z is coming out. That's x, that's y. I'll draw them right on here. So we'll draw z x and y. And then sigma 1, 2 is going to be in that direction on that face. So that's sigma 1, 2. And this will make sigma 2, 1. Okay. You notice that if we were to look at these forces in a different way, if we were to describe them as corresponding to perhaps an element that was shaped a little bit differently. Let's shape the element this way. We could resolve those forces, right, such that it looks like the resolve forces here would result in a tension this way. And the component of these, these two that lies parallel to that rotated set of axes would give a vector that rise this way. Notice that here we would expect the inverse, the components of these related to that or perpendicular to that surface. Give us this. This would give us this. It looks like we would get, if these are equal, it looks like we would give equal and opposite forces such that we have equal and opposite stresses. Turns out that that's exactly the case that we have here. So this shears that are applied here equivalently, if we were to rotate the axes, would give us this particular situation. So we could actually rotate our axes. And for this case, if we had rotated our axes so that we had x, and the rotated axis we're going to call x prime, and the rotated axis we're going to have here we're going to call y prime. If we had that rotated set of axes, we could describe a, a new set of values, right, a sigma ij prime set of values like this. This particular type of stress state is called pure shear. And since the drawing of the axes is arbitrary, it's a choice that we make, these are actually equivalent stress states. Okay, And we can see a couple things that are, are interesting about this stress state. You notice that if I were to sum the terms on this diagonal, right, it turns out if I sum these terms on the diagonal, sigma 1, 
1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3. And if I take the average, that actually gives the value of the hydrostatic stress. That is the magnitude of the hydrostatic stress. So there's zero pressure, right, running along this term. So this pure shear is a situation in which there's really no stress driving a volume change in the material. Everything is described by shear. And you can see that this is the equivalent case in sigma naught plus a negative sigma naught gives us zero. The sum of the terms along this diagonal is also equal to zero. So even though we change the coordinate system and rotate the coordinate system, turns out this diagonal stays the same. Turns out there's a rule related to that. This is an invariant. In other words, the sum of the terms on the diagonal does not change if we rotate the axes. It has to be constant because this describes the pressure, and pressure does not depend on the orientation. So these are equivalent stress states, and we can use this to describe, and we'll use this later whenever you talk about mechanical behavior in terms of deformation or what drives deformation. It turns out that you need a difference in stresses along that axis in order to define a particular condition for wherein mechanical deformation may take place. Another way to describe this sum of the terms on the diagonal is sigma m. This is, in this case, sigma m is the mean stress. Okay, it doesn't mean it be mean as in cruel, it means the average stress. And that mean stress is, in fact, the stress that it, it would drive volume change. If it's positive, it drives a vo positive volume change. If it's negative, it drives a negative volume change. Normally, that's only going to be an elastic case, although it may be different if it's a porous material or a material that has variations in density within it. If we actually subtract out the volume component, we can find what drives deformation. If we take sigma 1, 1 minus the mean stress, sigma 2, 2 minus the mean stress, sigma 3, 3 minus the mean stress, we can define something which I define here with just one element as the deviatoric stress. Right. And the deviatoric component is the component that causes the material to deviate or causes it to derive deformation and produce distortion.